Make It Right, the manufacturing podcast. Did you know that it's estimated that more than 150 billion disposable diaper units per year are used by babies, adults, and even dogs? For the most part, these soiled diapers end up in landfills. We all know this, so it isn't a dirty little secret. But what may be a dirty little secret is in the marketing that operates around some so-called greener or more organic biodegradable diapers, because apparently they may not be all that they seem. Welcome to the Make It Right podcast. I'm Janet Eastman, and this week on the show, my guest is Carlos Riche. He's the founder of the Disposable Diaper Network and principal at Riche Investments. Carlos has worked in the diaper industry for more than 30 years, and he believes this industry is on the cusp of the circular economy, where we'll be able to recycle or at least reclaim parts of soiled diapers to significantly lessen the impact on landfill. He's also here to address some of the misconceptions surrounding greener diapers and explain why their claims regarding the use of certain raw materials can be misleading. Now, just a word of warning, this conversation is likely to include the discussion of various bodily functions. I am very pleased to have Carlos Riche join me again on the Make It Right pod- podcast. Carlos, very good to speak to you again. Uh, Janet, thank you very much, and it's a pleasure meeting you again. I always, I always enjoy our conversations because, you know, they're pretty straightforward and you've got some fascinating facts. So I want to start this conversation with what I imagine you're going to think is a fairly naive question, but why do we actually need disposable diapers? If the impact on the environment is so big, why can't we go back to using cloth diapers? Well, uh, first, let, let me address the first question. Why do we need disposable diapers? Now, if you think about uh, us humans, uh, a good analogy is just to simplify us as a, as a, as a container, a sealed container. And in each one of those containers, you have an input, okay, and an output, as simple as that. And if we do a fluid mass balance, whatever we drink or we eat goes into this container. And uh, because it doesn't have unlimited space, of course, uh, some of that has to go out. And it goes out like uh, urine, like feces and sweat. Uh, and the sweat uh, is also part of the evaporation of the liquids that we have as an intake. So the problem is that some people uh, are unable to control by will uh, the output of these bodily fluids. So we call them incontinent. And this is not only applied for babies, but also for any other person, could be young or old, and, uh, and they go into the category of being uh, incontinent. In, and, it, and, and this incontinence uh, requires some protection to make sure uh, that uh, we can live a normal social life. Uh, this is the reason why we need the disposable diapers. Now, uh, we can always go back to cloth diapers. Of course, this is uh, something that we can do. But we can also get rid of our air conditioning and uh, we can get rid of our cars and so many other things. Uh, the point is that there are so many inventions that have made life easy and uh, they are convenient. So <clears throat> abandoning them uh, could be uh, difficult. One, one thing I want to point out about cloth diapers, uh, even though they are a valid option, and most times these are options that are forced onto babies. Moms don't ask permission to the baby if they want to use uh, uh, a cloth diaper. Uh, we know for a fact cloth diapers are not as dry to the skin as disposable diapers. So disposable diapers are always better from the point of view of comfort. But if uh, you are not asking the baby what is uh, the opinion, of course, it's very easy to force the environment onto babies when some uh, parents are not willing to do on themselves. Uh, there are, of course, a few uh, uh, moms that uh, will use, uh, you know, menstrual cup or this kind of uh, alternative uh, alternatives to the use of sanitary napkins. But uh, the majority continue to use the more convenient solutions like uh, sanitary napkins, uh, and uh, and then they may end up forcing the uh, cloth diapers onto their babies, which uh, is a lack of consistency. 
<laughs> anyway, yeah, we're getting but... already deep into the into the <laughs> into the topic. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So I get that point. So where we have disposable diapers, people are unlikely to give them up, no matter what the environmental impact. So this is what we're dealing with. It's 2019. Why don't we have a solution for the disposal of disposable diapers already? Um, I, I would say that we have uh, some solutions, not the total or complete solution, but we are moving in the right direction. Um, I, I've been involved with this industry for uh, oof, more than 35 years now. And I do remember the diapers that we were making 35 years ago. Okay. Uh, we have a, a, a special kind of diapers. We call it night diapers. And uh, I remember they were like 75, 80 grams. Uh, and uh, basically they were made with uh, cellulose, no, no super absorbent back then. And the capacity was quite low. Uh, today, uh, at an analogy of those diapers is that we can make a diaper with about 35 grams instead of 80, and it will hold at least three times more liquid than what it used to be uh, 35 years ago. So uh, we are moving quickly into uh, the direction of uh, optimizing raw materials, making them more efficient, so we have a, a better use of, uh, of the uh, ingredients that are in the, the diaper. So yes, we are we are slowly moving in the right direction, but I I believe we uh, need to go and continue in this direction to to find a permanent solution, so we don't have to be worried about uh, uh, the environment and the negative effect of disposable diapers. Okay, so there are a number of diaper products that are out there that claim to be more environmentally friendly than others, even biodegradable. They're made with bamboo, wood pulp, corn. So surely babies aren't crawling around with bags of corn on their butts. So how are, how are these diapers made and how can they be called environmentally friendly? Well, the, this is part of the of the problem that uh, many of brands of diapers today are forced to differentiate uh, as the only way to promote sales. And in their efforts to to be different from uh, other brands, uh, they start claiming things that are actually false or or not true. Um, the uh, one one of uh, of the issues has to do with. Um, uh, uh, a misleading claim. For example, uh, there are several brands of diapers that claim to use natural bamboo uh, fibers. And, uh, and this is not true. Uh, most of those brands that claim uh, natural bamboo fibers, what they do is they take the bamboo fibers, uh, and they put them into a very uh, harsh chemical process with uh, uh, strong acid. Uh, the fibers are dissolved and then they are transformed into viscose, uh, which is not a natural fiber, it's a man-made fiber. Um, and, and this is the one that is uh, in contact with the skin of the baby or the skin of the user. Uh, of course, uh, these type of products are not natural fibers and they should be, uh, uh, they should be very clear. Uh, you can say my product has uh, uh, bamboo uh, that was used to make viscose, but you cannot say it's a natural fiber anymore. So <clears throat> they, there are, of course, some uh, situations where uh, the, um, uh, the sourcing of the raw material can be uh, natural. For example, you can use from corn and then make ethanol. And then from the ethanol, you can make actually, you can make uh, polyethylene or polypropylene. Uh, or even a super absorbent like uh, uh, polyacrylate. All of these synthetic polymers can be made out of natural sourcing. Uh, the real issue right now is that how are you able to identify that these plastics were actually made from these uh, uh, natural sources? Uh, someone can buy one ton of these materials and then sell uh, 10 tons of them uh, claiming that uh, it was uh, all of them made from natural resources. And it's very difficult unless there's a continuous audit uh, on the supply chain to be able to know if, uh, if this is actually true or not. Okay? Uh, so the, the Federal Trade Commission, for, as an example, has uh, already uh, made uh, uh, 
uh, very strong statements regarding uh, the illegality of a brand claiming to use uh, natural uh, bamboo fibers when in reality they're using viscous. So uh, I think we need to get our act together as an industry and try to avoid these uh, misleading claims that uh, are not good for uh, the image of the industry. So I'm thinking about this process when you're taking bamboo and you're turning it into viscose and you're saying you're using all these acids. So the actual making or turning the bamboo into the viscose, I'm sure that that has an environmental impact as well. So if you're buying these environmentally friendly, and I put that in quotation marks, diapers, the whole process to actually make the diaper is not environmentally friendly as well, correct? That, that, that is correct. Uh, in, in fact, I don't know if you're aware, but the, the very first diapers that came into the market in, back in 1961, I mean, I'm talking in, in big mass scales, uh, was the Pampers from Procter & Gamble. And, and that product uh, was made with rayon, which is basically a viscose that comes from, uh, from pine tree. Uh, and and uh, when you compare uh, the viscose, uh, the original viscose of, of, from the pine tree, uh, the rayon, and with uh, the new viscose coming from bamboo, uh, the bamboo is much more difficult fiber to digest, to, to dissolve. So the chemical process is even stronger than what it used to be in 1961 to make rayon. So my, my point is that the, if you compare between uh, the, the, these uh, uh, diapers made of uh, natural bamboo fibers uh, with the original uh, product from 1961, uh, they, they are not better than that. And the reason why those products were uh, substituted with uh, synthetics was because uh, they have a tendency to absorb uh, humidity. So the, uh, the feeling against the skin of the baby is not as dry. There's uh, something we call in our industry uh, the rewet. Rewet meaning um, how dry is the surface when you apply pressure and when the diaper is, is wet already. And uh, <clears throat> there is no natural fiber today that uh, uh, can compare with uh, the dry feeling of uh, synthetic fibers. Um, so there are alternatives on how to make products with uh, a larger percentage of natural fibers, but they usually need to be blended. Uh, uh, viscose, for example, by itself, uh, if you weight uh, the raw material, about 70% of the weight is uh, the amount of liquid that it can absorb. So it means that this sheet that is in contact with the skin of the baby will remain uh, humid, which uh, is not really the best uh, in terms of comfort. If, uh, if um, someone is wearing a diaper and the diaper is wet, uh, the urine gets cold and, and this cold environment touching the skin uh, doesn't allow you to sleep. Uh, this is the reason why babies cry in the night. Uh, and this is why also adults using diapers uh, are not comfortable. They cannot sleep well if, if they feel cold. So uh, this is really part of the problem of natural fibers. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about biodegradable because people think that biodegradable yes. sounds great, but there's going to be environmental impacts from that because people always talk about methane gas and, and things like that. So I'm assuming because they're diapers, there is methane gas created when these are supposed to be biodegrading. Yes, and, and you're absolutely, absolutely correct. Uh, <clears throat> the, the, the whole point of uh, 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 environment is to help protect it in the long term so things uh, get better, not get worse. If you look at the concept of biodegradability, <clears throat> it means that you take some raw materials, okay, and you are adding energy to process them, and then you are discarding them with the, the idea that they are going to disappear forever. And what you are really doing is uh, you are taking all of that effort, all of that energy to make them, to make it disappear. But but it, it doesn't work like that. It does not disappear. When you have a biodegradation process, you are creating CO2, okay, carbon dioxide, and methane. And methane gas, uh, depending on which uh, uh, life cycle analysis, I mean, if you're looking at the uh, methane gas after 10 years or after 20 years or 50 years, 
depending on your reference of uh, the expiration of the methane gas, it can be many, many times um, more negative than the effect of the um, carbon dioxide. For example, if, even if you look at, an, at a window of only 10 years, the, the methane in the environment is creating um, uh, this negative effect in the environment that is at least 26 times worse than, than CO2. So <laughs> it means that um, this whole idea that things disappear and you can be happy is, uh, is not true. Biodegradation is not the solution for the environment. We need something better than that. Um, today, I have not seen any composting facility or landfill um, that uh, that recover the methane gas. There are a few of them. Uh, in fact, here in my city, in Monterrey, Mexico, uh, we do have uh, methane recovery landfills, but this is an exception. Uh, most everywhere in the world, uh, we don't have these systems to collect the methane that is generated during the biodegradation. So uh, the, the end result is that this whole process of biodegrading something is, is not as good as people think. In fact, it's, it's quite bad. So if we're looking for a solution for this industry and it's not biodegrading, what are the options? Reclaiming, incinerating, what are the options out there for this industry? Yes, uh, well, incinerating has been uh, the preferred method in many of the countries in, in Europe, okay? Uh, they, they go to, through a process where they, uh, uh, they, they, they first uh, have a, um, an, uh, let's say a salt that will make the superabsorbent uh, break away. Uh, for example, um, if, uh, the, the, the problem with soil diapers is that uh, they, they gel the, uh, the, uh, the urine. Okay? So there's a lot of water in a soil diaper. And then if you want to incinerate a soil diaper with water, a lot of the energy that is needed uh, to burn the diaper is wasted just by evaporating the water content in the soil diaper. So, so one, one of the things that is, is, is being done first is to be able to remove all of the, um, all of the urine from, uh, from, 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 the, uh, from, from the diaper. Uh, so that you can uh, press it, uh, remove the water, and then you are burning it. By burning the diaper, you are, in fact, recovering the energy of the diaper by converting that heat into electrical energy. And, uh, and, and, and this, uh, this process, uh, in fact, it's, uh, it's been used for, for, for decades in, in, in Europe. Um, this, this way of, uh, for example, using calcium chloride, you deactivate the superabsorbent. So with calcium chloride, it would be uh, similar to what happens. I don't know. Few people have made an, a simple experiment. If you have a, a, a diaper with water, it gels uh, and uh, it swells by by gelling the the, the water. Uh, and if you add a table salt, okay, on top of this uh, soil diaper. Uh, you will see that most of the liquid is released. The superabsorbent is not capable of holding uh, the water when you have electrolytes. So um, if you can imagine uh, these diapers and you add uh, calcium chloride, which is a, a, a very strong uh, double positive ion, uh, you can remove the water and then you can compress them and then you can burn them to, to recover the energy or they can be converted into RDF, what they call refuse derived fuel, as a way to create uh, also energy. Uh, so th this is a technology that's been available. Uh, the problem with this technology of incineration is that you generate CO2, okay, which we also want to avoid from creating CO2. In, in, a, in a more uh, global example, uh, the trees that we have in the world are basically growing by converting CO2 into the wood, okay? If, uh, if you end up converting the wood back again uh, by, by uh, burning this wood or these soil diapers, you release all of the CO2 that uh, these trees were able to capture when, when they were growing. Now, if you have uh, another alternative, which would be, let's say that all of those soil diapers are not burned uh, or incinerated, but you are recovering the raw materials, 
by a post-consumer recycling process, then all of that CO2 doesn't go back into the environment, but you are uh, using it as raw materials in other components. So the cycle, in, in fact, is a carbon negative, meaning that uh, all of those trees, you are cutting them and converting it into diapers, but you are putting new trees and they are taking more CO2 from the environment. And because you do not end up burning them, uh, you, uh, in fact, have a, a negative balance, which is very helpful for the plant. Okay, so if we are actually going to sit down and start thinking about reclaiming parts of a diaper, how do we go yes. about doing that? Well, the, the technology to, to reclaim diapers, there are several companies that are currently working in this direction, and they are really very close into finding uh, um, a, a technologies that, that will be, uh, you know, uh, proving themselves to, to, to be the, the definite solution. Uh, the, one of the bottlenecks of all of these uh, uh, recycling technologies is how to collect uh, the soil diapers. Uh, and this is where uh, we need a combination of education and, uh, and also to make it easier for consumers. Um, for example, uh, imagine that uh, we have a simple way of giving a, a bag to the parents, so all of the soil bag diapers go into this bag, but then uh, you throw this bag into the garbage truck. But the garbage truck has these uh, high uh, compactors, okay? Under extreme pressures, this bag will explode, they will open and they will mix with the other garbage in the, in the truck. So uh, this solution does not work, even though it seems so simple that people will, will probably uh, do it this way. Uh, is not practical. So, so it means that uh, uh, because of the way on how we collect uh, the garbage from the homes, we need to um, ask for something else. For example, for people to bring the soil, uh, you know, the, the, the bag with soil diapers uh, to a collection place, which could be near the supermarket or it could be at the outside of the hospital, or I don't know, it could be in, in many different places, but people will have to help into bringing all those soil diapers to that particular place where then we can collect all of them and put them into a post-consumer recycling process. Now, even though it may seem not very convenient, I can tell you this is by far easier than anything else we are doing today, which, uh, for example, having your own uh, compost facility uh, in your backyard, which by the way uh, is not, as I said before, is not the optimal solution because you end up creating methane gas. So uh, if instead of uh, handling your own uh, backyard uh, you know, composting facility, you are basically just uh, ask, being asked to, to, to take your soil diapers and put them into a collecting bin so that they can be transported into a uh, a factory where uh, they're going to be doing this uh, post-consumer recovery. So I got, I have two questions here, Carlos. One, yes. I find it I, like, I really, I wonder if people would actually take their soil diapers to a drop-off point. Like that, that's kind of mm -hmm. curious to me, but I understand the, the reasoning behind that because if you were to engage a diaper truck to go around and collect all the diapers. That is, I mean, people are always traveling to the supermarket. They're going there anyway, so they can drop their stuff off. But to have a truck go around and collect everybody's diapers just adds to the environmental impact, doesn't it? Yes, but, uh, but it, I mean, it can be minimal, because, as you said, because they already have to go there. So it's not that they're making an extra trip uh, or wasting energy to take the diapers to the, to the collection point. Uh, maybe they go and do their shopping and are doing at the same time they're they are t bringing with them the, the collected diapers for the last week but you know people are doing extreme sacrifices right now some of them i mean just imagine uh, I, I always put a, a a good way to understand what uh, is happening here is uh, when uh, an adult is willing to try uh, an adult diaper on themselves which of course is not very common but if you ever try to test an adult diaper on yourself and you add uh, 200 milliliters of saline water just to simulate urine, and then you try to go to sleep, 
okay? It's almost impossible. I mean, you, you feel wet and cold. You want to remove that wet diaper and put something dry. It's exactly the same thing that happens with babies, okay? Uh, adults are very uh, easy. They immediately understand the negative effects of the rewet when, when they are incontinent and they have to be trying diapers on themselves. But, you know, uh, moms uh, sometimes are not aware that uh, they are forcing their babies to go through these uh, uh, sacrifices, okay? Uh, instead of having them to be more comfortable at night, okay? So my, my point is that if people are already doing uh, these uh, sacrifices because of, uh, you know, they, they are environmental conscious and they want to, to do it right, uh, then I think putting a bag of soil diapers into a container, that would be very simple and very easy. It's not that big of a sacrifice after all. Right. So um, are there technologies out there that are in development right now that are going to address this diaper dilemma? And, and you know, what would be the impact on the cost of a diaper? Well, th there are several technologies right now. And, and uh, I mean, all of this uh, work in uh, post-consumer recycling was uh, a secret before. Uh, but uh, about a year ago, there was uh, one company that made it public what they were doing in this area, and almost everyone else, all of the companies are starting to open themselves and say, hey, by the way, I'm, I'm also working in diaper recycling. Oh, me too, and me too, and me too. So, so now we have uh, at least more than five uh, technologies that are being developed today uh, to, to solve this problem. Um, but some of those that are being more vocal and more public is Procter & Gamble uh, with uh, what uh, um, they have done in, uh, with uh, their joint venture in Fater, Italy. Uh, they have uh, uh, a prototype facility that uh, is being handling all of the needs of a community of one million people, and they have already announced that they're scaling it up. Uh, another one that is being very public about it has been a Unicharm, um, and uh, Kimberly Clark has done the same. FCT has done also more recently, has also announced that they are working in post-consumer recycling. Now, there are differences between the, the different technologies. Some of them, for example, the Unicharm technology is using uh, not only the components uh, in the diaper, but also the feces and the urine uh, uh, as a biomass to generate uh, you know, uh, ozone gas, uh, first electricity and then ozone. And the ozone is using to bleach the pulp that is recovered from the post-consumer diapers. And then that pulp is used to make uh, cardboard boxes and all other things. Um, Procter & Gamble uh, has been also very, very open and right now um, they, they are using it as a public relations campaign to, to, to show the world what, they, what they're doing. Um, I believe we are uh, no more than five, maybe six, seven years probably away from having a definite solution where every diaper will be uh, re recycled. Uh, I am confident that we are very, very close and I don't think the cost of the diaper is going to go up. Uh, the only reason why it will go up is if uh, people are not willing to, to help in this uh, uh, in this uh, process by, for example, making it more difficult to collect the diapers. If, um, if I am not willing to take the soil diapers to a collection point, uh, then someone is going to have to do it for me. And then you have to pay for those services as an additional cost, which most likely it will not be recovered by the raw materials that you're getting out from the soil diapers. So if, on the other hand, uh, most people are willing to help the whole system because they believe this is something good for the planet, I don't think uh, the, the cost of the diaper has to go up because most of the raw materials that you are recovering from the process will pay for the reclaiming process. So it will be sustainable. Yes? Right. So ultimately, I guess one, one process is going to be the winner and we just have to wait and see which one that's going to be. Yes, and, and, and this is what is so uh, uh, nice about what's happening today. All, all of these big companies, they want to, to, to get the, the medal of being the first one to solve one uh, very uh, um, important environmental uh, problem that we have today. 
And being able to say, I was the first, or this is the process that is being used, uh, that would be great for the image of the company. As you can imagine, um, if you develop a technology to recover diapers and uh, to um, convert them in something useful, uh, this technology, it doesn't matter if it's coming from, from Unicharm or from Procter & Gamble or Kimberly Clark or SCP or wh whoever it may be, even there are some independent companies that are also doing the same. Uh, it will not be that uh, my post-consumer technology, it will only accept uh, Pampers diapers. Okay? The, it's irrelevant. You can, you can bring a Kimberly Clark product or an SCP diaper or a, an independent private label diaper and it will still work because it doesn't. It, it has nothing to do with the, with the brand of the diaper. M my point is that once you develop the technology that is proven itself to be sustainable and economic, uh, it will be open for all kinds and all brands of diapers, uh, and that is in the best interest of the industry. Uh, I think it would be. Uh, totally wrong if, uh, if I am a Procter & Gamble to restrict uh, diapers. So, okay, I will recycle only those that are pampers, but everyone else, uh, you throw them into the landfill. Uh, I think on the contrary, uh, all of these companies are competing to be able to provide an open platform so any brand of diapers could be uh, recycled. And there's some really good raw materials that you can uh, reuse, and there's uh, it's really really interesting because uh, uh, you know a lot of what gets into a diaper are are products that have uh, uh, more life that should not be thrown away. I think when you say that like there's more than 150 billion disposable diaper units used every year, that is if you look at it as a a material on its own, there is a massive opportunity in there for for this process, and uh, whatever the final winner is is going to uh, going to have something really great to work with. Carlos, thank you so much for your insights today. Uh, you're welcome, Janet. It's uh, it's been really great talking to you again, and I know that um, you know I'm sure we'll chat again about this industry because. I had no idea when I first talked to you about a year ago that this industry had so much technology behind it, but uh, you have to be a chemist, you have to be all kinds of other things to understand this industry, so I really appreciate your insight, and uh, you've been at it for 30 years, you're a wealth of knowledge, so thank you very much. Thank you, Janet. Carlo, Carlos Riche is the founder of the Disposable Diaper Network, and he is the principal at Riche Investments. That is our show for this week. If you want to learn anything more about diapers, just do a Google search on the process on how these things are made. It's fascinating. Please check out our Twitter, LinkedIn, and Facebook feeds to learn more about manufacturing. You can subscribe to our podcast through iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, Spotify, and YouTube. And until next time, I'm Janet Eastman. Thanks very much for listening to the Make It Right podcast.